You've heard that old expression that nothing is certain but death and taxes. But you don't have to pay taxes. You'll go to jail, but you don't have to do it. However, death is ugly, unnatural, and morbidly efficient. Since death is so terrible, we try to lighten it by calling it different things like taking a dirt nap or buying the farm or pushing up daisies or kicking the bucket. Or my personal favorite for being buried in a coffin is checking in at the wooden Waldorf. <laughs> death is an inescapable fact of life. Death is ruthless. It frequently comes without warning and it strikes without mercy. Death is also unrelenting. It cannot be cheated, bribed, outwitted, overcome, or eluded. Death is also indiscriminate in that it takes young and old, poor and rich, sick and healthy, the wicked and the benevolent, and death is also universal in that it all, that it all must ultimately succumb to its darkness. Death is a harsh reality of life, but it was not always so, and it need not be the end. Before he died in January, in 2015, the New York Times reported that television commentator Larry King was obsessed with death. They reported his day begins with reading obituaries, and he ponders who would give his eulogy at his funeral. He smiles and thinks that it might be Bill Clinton, and then his face becomes blank and he says, but I won't be there to see it. He has had a heart attack, prostate cancer, diabetes, and seven divorces. He was 77 years old when CNN dropped him, and when that happened, he became aware that there will come a day when he will die. When he learned from television of the death of Osama bin Laden, this drove him to jump up on his feet and say, I needed to be on the air. But then he realized that he had nowhere to go. To fight against aging and death, he takes hormone pills for human growth, four of them each day. He also plans on his body being frozen so that someday he may live again. The New York Times writer reports, it's nuts concedes King, but at least it gives him a shred of hope. Larry King said, other people have no hope. Well, Larry, that's where you're wrong. Some people do have hope, and it's not just wish fulfillment. It is a hope that is founded on fact. They are called Christians. Today we're going to start looking at the famous story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And in that we're going to learn that for the believer, death does not get the final laugh. Here in verse 1, God is going to bring two champions face to face. It's David against Goliath. It's Jesus against death. And God, like a fight promoter, is going to construct a ring for this to occur in. Look at verse 1 with me. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. Lazarus is the shortened form of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means God is helped or helped by God, which is fitting in light of this story. We are told that Bethany is the town of Mary and Martha, her sister. Leaving together in a house presumably given to them by their parents, two sisters and a brother become friends with a radical rabbi, a controversial figure, a miracle worker named Jesus of Nazareth. And as they opened up their hearts to him, they also opened up their homes to him. Yet although no doubt Jesus greatly appreciated their hospitality and loved the friendship they offered him so freely, their linkage with him and the relationship to him did not insulate them from difficulty or immunize them from tragedy. Thus, as chapter 11 opens, we see ominous storm clouds hovering over this little home in Bethany. So, too, 
I think that most of us who love the Lord have opened the home of our hearts to him and who wants to be linked with him have also discovered that these sentiments do not insulate, isolate, or protect us from dark days. Let's take a look and see how this family navigated the waters of difficulty. Of the three friends, Martha is the last one mentioned. But we begin with her, for in many senses, she was the most prominent person. And the effect that the miracle had on her was the most pronounced. In fact, the resurrection of her brother Lazarus seems to have been a turning point in her life. Now, why would I say that? Well, fortunately, we know a lot more about Martha than is recorded in chapter 11. The information is contained in the story of a visit by Jesus to Mary and Martha's home, told in Luke chapter 10. Jesus had gone to Bethany and was invited to the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus for dinner. Now, Lazarus is not mentioned in the story, but we are told that Mary sat at Jesus' feet to learn from him, while Martha was hampered by much serving. Finally, Martha began to scold. She came to where Jesus and Mary were sitting and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work all by myself? Tell her to get off her took us and help me. She actually didn't say the word took us, and I hope the word took us doesn't offend you. Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. It is important to note that it is not the fact that she was serving that was the problem, but that she was all worked up about it and was being unkind to others as a result. Now, we are not left merely to surmise this, for there is a clue to this interpretation in the earlier story. It is the use of the pronouns my and me in her complaint to Jesus. And all they are used three different times. Mary said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha did not have her mind on Jesus at this point or even the welfare of her sister Mary. She was distracted. And if you break that word up, it means disattracted or not attracted. So instead of being attracted to Christ and his words, Mary was more attracted to what she was doing. She had her mind on herself. And because she had her mind on herself, she felt unappreciated, neglected, and abused. Later, when she had gotten her mind off of herself and onto the Lord, she lost those feelings and did what she did joyfully. Now, where do I get that from? With this story still in mind, we now turn to another story, which we will see in John chapter 12. Once again, the setting is Bethany, the town of Martha and Mary, but the home is not Martha's home. It is the home of Simon, identified only as the leper by Mark, a man who had undoubtedly been healed by Jesus. Again, the occasion is a dinner party. The verses in John begin. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived in Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and we are simply told Martha served. Notice, first of all, it was a large party. On this occasion, Jesus was present with his disciples. That alone makes 13. And in addition to these were Simon, Mary, and Lazarus. So not counting Martha, that puts the number at 16. Second, notice once again that Martha is serving. But that on this occasion, she does not appear in the least bit troubled, but rather seems to be serving with a carefree spirit. Here she has 16 guests and is not troubled. So what made the difference? Obviously, only the resurrection of her brother, which comes between the two suppers, in which she learned to get her mind off of herself and onto the Lord. Look at verse 2 with me. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped her feet with, or his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. 
Therefore the sister sent him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. The Gospels nearly always present Mary at being at Jesus' feet. In the first of these three stories, the story that involves Martha's rebuke, we see Mary listening to Jesus and learning from him. It says, Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. In John 11, we find the same thing, only here we find her expressing disbelief. Lazarus had died. Jesus had come and talked to Martha. Then he called for Mary, who came running and at once fell at his feet. We are told these words. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This leads us to another thought about Mary. For if we ask ourselves why she anointed Christ's feet with that ointment, the answer is she did it in view of his coming death. Jesus says so himself. And this means that of all those who were with Jesus during the final months of his life, it seems that only Mary understood that he was going to die for the sins of the world. Moreover, if we then ask, but how did Mary come to know this when the others apparently failed to understand it? The answer is found in the first of the points that we made about her, namely, that she spent time learning at the feet of Jesus. Now this does bring us to a dilemma in verse 3. And what is that? It is where it says, it's where they say to Jesus, the one you love is sick. We need to notice an important point because it's often forgotten. The point is that even those whom Jesus especially loves get sick and eventually dies. It may be that Mary and Martha, known as little of God's ways at that point in their lives, as many Christians seem to know today, were surprised that someone whom Jesus loved got sick. The Greek word that John uses here is telling as there are two principal words for sick in the Greek. And the one that Jesus chooses implies that he was deathly sick, or could be translated, he was sinking. In other words, we are to learn from this sickness that, it is, that in a believer's life is no way incompatible with the Lord's love for them. In the first place, they need not be surprised for the simple reason that the man whom Jesus loves is, after all, still just a man. And it is in the nature of mankind to suffer body ailments. Spurgeon writes, The love of Jesus does not separate us from the common necessities and infirmities of human life. Men of God are still men. The covenant of grace is not a charter of exemption from consumption or rheumatism or asthma. Moreover, we should not be surprised at illness. For we know that it is often God's way of speaking to our hearts and leading us on further in the Christian faith. That is, it is often used by God for our good. Now, many have known this. David knew it. For he wrote in one of the Psalms, It was good for me to be afflicted. Why? So that I might learn your decrees. But even with that said, I want you to notice there in verse 3 that, that to some people, it is inconceivable that God's love and sickness can be in the same verse. But this teaches us that sickness is not a reflection of his love or lack of love. Jesus loves Lazarus and Lazarus loves him. But Lazarus is not only going to get sick, he is going to die from that sickness. But that won't be the final word for Lazarus or for any who love the Lord. We will either be healed down here or we will receive our ultimate healing in heaven. I look forward to that. I'm at the age now that I no longer jump out of bed and start doing push-ups. 
Instead, there's a lot of groaning. And it takes about eight minutes for all my parts to finally synchronize and begin moving. Getting old is no fun. Have you ever woke up and something was hurting that didn't hurt when you went to sleep? How can that happen? <laughs> well, enough about my problems. So anyway, my point was that there are some well-meaning Christians who believe that being loved by God and being sick are mutually exclusive. But here they are in the same verse. Now this leads us, however, to the second characteristic of the sisters' prayer, which is the basis of their appeal. And what was the basis of their appeal to Jesus? Was it that they often had Jesus in their home and therefore he owed them something? No. Was it that they had served him faithfully and been true to him when others of the disciples had dropped away? No. Was it that they loved him? No. The basis of their appeal is that he loved them. That is, it was in God's love rather than in the love of man, that they took refuge. Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus about 20 miles away that the one that he loved was sick. I like that. They didn't say, the one that loves you is sick, but rather the one you love is sick. Like Martha and Mary, I don't approach the Lord on the basis of my love for him. Why? Because my love for the Lord can be fickle and feeble. But his love for me, however, is always fixed and firm. He's never surprised by what I say. He's never taken aback by what I do. Therefore, wise is the man or woman who approaches the Lord based on his love. It is interesting there that the Greek word translated for love, there is not agape, which is the perfect love that gives simply for the sake of giving, but phileo, which refers to a fe affection or friendship. And maybe this morning you think the Lord loves you because he is love and therefore he has to love you, kind of like a grandparent. That's not true. Jesus said, I have not called you servants, but what? Friends. And yet, we're going to see in verse 5 that instead of rushing to them, Jesus stays two days longer in the place where he was, and he allows Lazarus to die. From this, we can learn that Jesus may be completely informed of our trouble and yet act as though he is completely indifferent to it. We also learn that prayer for the sick may not be answered, at least not with a yes. Indeed, if that were not the case, no one would ever become sick or die as long as they had a friend or relative to pray for them. No, the comfort in our prayers is not the fact that Jesus always answers them as we wish, for he does not. It is that he who made us and controls all circumstances knows best and is well able to direct even sickness and death to his glory. First of all, we are taught the wisdom of Christ's love. Now, you wouldn't think that would be the first thing it tells you, but it does. The wisdom of Christ's love. When Lazarus was about to die, his sister sent a message to Jesus, and all they said was, the one that you love is sick. Now, here's the teaching. The love of Jesus Christ may and often does include trouble and trials in our lives. His loving plan for you may and often does include the experiences of trouble and suffering. He whom thou lovest is sick. A lot of people find this very difficult. But I am learning that my prayers are always answered. Sometimes I know that God has said yes because he grants my request. Sometimes I know he has said no because he doesn't grant my request. However, when I don't get an immediate response, I console myself with the thought that he may just be saying, 
wait for a while. The Bible tells us that we inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. Now that doesn't come easy to the give it to me now generation that we have become. So, yes, no, and wait a while are all answers to, be, all answers to prayer. They just may not be the answers that we wanted. Verse 4, please. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Just comes right through and says, The reason Lazarus is sick is for the glory of God. And this is so similar to what we looked at weeks ago when we were in John chapter 9. That's the place where the disciples were looking at a man born blind, and they said to Jesus, look at this tragedy. Look at this misery and this pain in this person's life. Now, why does he have this kind of pain in his life? Was it his sin, or was it his parents' sin? What does Jesus say there, and what is he saying here? He said, neither. What he's actually saying is to his disciples and to us is, Abandon your stupid linear thinking. Abandon your simplistic notions that good people would have good lives and bad people would have painful lives. Instead, he turns around and says, listen to me. I'm saying to you that things aren't that simple. Understand, if you belong to God, suffering may come into your life. But God may have great plans for what he's going to do in your life and the lives of the people around you through that very suffering. Like the blind man, Lazarus' illness, death and resurrection, they were all for the glory of God. Now contrary to the teaching of some, Christ's response indicates that sickness, and get this, even death may sometimes be God's will for his people. Now I know personally and firsthand that when Christians who say that God always has a purpose in suffering are sometimes accused of just providing pat answers. Friends, it's much more of a pat answer to believe that only bad people should suffer. And it's even more of a pat answer to just say God is unfair if a good person suffers. Instead, the answer in the Bible is enormously complex. It's an enormously sophisticated one. The answer in the Bible is every incident that happens to a Christian, God may have not one or two, but dozens of purposes. And they're all interwoven with all the purposes of every other incident. Now somebody says, how in the world could my pain and tragedy show forth the glory and love and power of God? I simply don't see it. Well, one of the problems is the Bible. Allow me to explain. I wish you could see your faces. See, whenever suffering is shown to us, here is the explanation that goes with it. It's easy to see why Jesus let Lazarus sicken and die, isn't it? We are learning that on Wednesday nights as we study the book of Job. It's easy to see why Lazarus was sick and died because we see right here in the book, Jesus was later on going to come and raise him from the dead and show forth his power. So we don't complain because we have it all right here. The real problem is, what about you and me? What about our disappointments? What about our pains and sicknesses? What about our tragedies? We aren't in the book and therefore the temptation is to pit your wisdoms against God's and to say the things I am experiencing are pointless. Yet I can tell you millions of people who believe in Christ will witness the fact that suffering in the life of a Christian is not pointless at all. A doctor told me two weeks ago that I'm going to have back pain for the rest of my life and that's just how it is. That doesn't make me doubt the love of God. Why? Because the Bible tells me in 2 Corinthians 4 16 so we do not lose heart though our outer self is wasting away 
Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That tells me not only should I not be surprised, I should expect my body to break down. Welcome to planet Earth. We hope you enjoy your stay. Listen, God's love for his own is not a pampering love. It is a perfecting love. The fact that he loves us and we love him is no guarantee we'll be sheltered from the problems and the pain of this life. After all, the father loves his son, yet the father permitted his beloved son to drink the cup of sorrow and experience the shame and the pain of the cross. So we must never think that love and suffering are incompatible. Certainly they unite in Jesus Christ. For many of us, we'd be the first to say that if it, if it wasn't for trouble, if it wasn't for pain, if it wasn't for suffering, we would have never have known and never seen that we are finite, that we are fragile and limited creatures. Many of us would say we would have never even seen the truth. We would have never seen that God, that we needed all this if God was for us. When something is taken out of your life that makes you strong, when you lose your job, when you lose your health, when you lose some part of your life that is important to you, or for your safety, or your comfort, or your joy, the first thing that happens is you feel like you have lost control over your life. That's what happens. You can get mad at the helplessness. You feel like, I was in control of my life, and now it's been wrested away from me. You get very angry. But eventually, by God's grace, your sight and vision made clear, and this is what you see. It's not until you lose control of your life that you see that you never had it. It's not until you lose control of your prosperity and your health that you realize that you never really were in control in the first place. You realize that your life was always basically based on outside factors that you had absolutely no control over. With all that said, that does not mean that even though we should not be surprised at sickness and death, that doesn't mean that we are to desire sickness. Nor does it mean that we can tell Jesus of our desire to have the sick one made well. I guess it really comes down to whether we really want God to do anything in our lives if it will bring him ultimate glory. Now, one reason we can lose our peace in these kind of situations is when we forget that my life was given to him at the time of my conversion, and it can be used for his glory, and he can do with it whatever he wants to do. And most of the time, when peace is lacking in my life, it is because in some way I am fighting against that surrender. I can have the tendency to want my life to translate into this physical thing, or this material thing, or this relational thing. And if I'm not careful, my life can be lived in such a way that the glory of God is not on the agenda at all. But when that does happen, I discover I now have no peace. It is a wondrous day in the life of a Christian when he or she can say, Lord God, my life is completely surrendered to you. I ask you to do whatever you need to do to receive the most glory you can from my life. If God is glorified by a Christian's illness, then the illness is for God's good and for the good who of all who will see the particular demonstration of his glory. In the case of Lazarus, just to give one example, for thousands of years, people have been getting good from it. And even today, as we study it, we are richer because the beloved brother of Mary and Martha died. As we finish up this morning, take note of one last important detail. Jesus didn't promise that Lazarus wouldn't die. He promised his sickness wouldn't end in death.
his point? Death might claim the life of Lazarus, and eventually it did again. But death would not have the final say in the matter. I love Justin Martyr here when he said, You can kill us, but you can't hurt us. And yet, many of us weep at the thought of death. Do you? Do you dread your death? And is that dread robbing you of the joy of life? It can. It did for a young woman named Florence. At the age of 37, she told her friends that her life hung by a thread that might snap at any moment. So she went to bed and stayed there for 53 years. Her death declaration did prove to be true. She did die at the age of 90. Doctors could find nothing wrong and left shaking their heads. Most diagnosed her as a helpless hypochondriac, dreading death, and yet ever obsessed by its imminence. Except for three years of her life, Florence cowered before the giant of death. But during those three years on the Crimean battlefront, she made a name for herself. Not as one who suffered, but as a friend who did. You've probably heard of her. She was history's most famous nurse, Florence Nightingale. And yet, sadly, she lived as a slave of death. But she didn't have to, and neither do we. Father, I do thank you for your word. I thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. And this is what you have done in the lives of all the Christians represented here, Lord. It's amazing. And I think only eternity will tell the times that we thought may have been the worst times of our lives we will look back on and realize that they may have been the most fruitful times of our lives when you were growing us in the pain. So I pray, Father, that if there's anyone here who does not know you, that today would be that day that they would come to know you and lose their fear of death. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.